Hey folks, Todd Colburn here with your Aerospace Structure Series. Today's lecture is Lecture 12B on Singularity Functions for Shear and Moment Diagrams. We're going to find that these are a very powerful way to quickly and efficiently write the loading, shear, moment, and later we'll find that we can use these to also find the slope and the deflection of the beam. Let's see how it works. So we saw last time in the last sub-lecture 12a that each beam, each of these beams requires multiple shear functions for the different segments of the beam and they require multiple moment functions for each segment of the beam. While this is not a big deal if there's only one or uh, two, one or two functions required, it can be quite a hassle when we have something like four, five, seven different functions of each of these. And this gets increasingly challenging as you go on to calculate slopes and moments. So one powerful way is to write a single function for the beam. And we're going to start with... Uh, the loading, and then look at how that translates into shear and moment. So we can actually write the singularity function directly for loads, shears, and moments. But I recommend that you focus on just writing the singularity function for the loading function, and then use that to and then integrate that in order to get the shear and the moment. We'll find that the integrations are among the easiest that we do, and it's very doable for any uh, student of engineering or industry professional. So let's say first we're going to take our beam and we want to resketch our beam as a free body diagram or as a loading diagram. A loading diagram is something is a, that's a term that I like to use to represent what that free body diagram is for the entire beam. So we remove any constraints, we replace them with the forces and moments that they can transfer into the beam. We, I call that the loading diagram when it's fully dimensioned as this one is. And then we're ready to start analyzing this beam because we have all external loads on the beam and we have all dimensions that are pertinent for analyzing those external loads on the beam. So sketch your beam with any loads, make sure you've got a free body diagram. We will then figure out what our reactions are for the beam. We're going to need to know what these are. Then we're going to move from right to left. And for every external load that we encounter, we're going to write a term, the singularity function term. And it's going to look kind of like this. For this particular beam, we're going to find we have two terms one for each external load that's not at the right end of the beam. We'll look later at how this, these functions uh, are uh, created, but it's insightful to notice at this point that where before we needed two functions for shear and two functions for moment, we're going to find out that this single loading function for the beam can become a single shear function for the beam and a single moment function for the beam by simply integrating. Okay, this is very powerful. And this is actually a rather simple beam. So let's uh, go ahead and set our nomenclature and understand this a little further before we get into the weeds of where they come from. We're going to define this loading function as a function w of x. That's our loading function. It's going to have some constant and it's going to look something like this. So this first thing it defines it as the loading function and that, that and it shows that that function is a function of x as we move from left to right. Now you can actually make it of any x, any variable, but it is a good practice to just focus on always identifying the origin at the left end of the beam and positive x moving to the right and then write your equations as a function of x. You will find that even though every now and then there's a beam that's easier if you reverse it for some people, for folks that only do this occasionally, students and industry professionals that aren't doing this every day, you will generally find that keeping it simple and the same will make it easier, even if you're doing a little more math and algebra. So 
w of x defines as the loading function. The next term is this constant at the start. This is typically the load or some other parameter like the slope or something like that. We then have these brackets, these two carrots. Instead of a regular parentheses, we're going to use carrots when it's a sing uh, singularity function. Whenever we see these carrots, it's going to notify everybody that this is not a regular function. It is a singularity function. It needs to be treated differently. Okay? It also uh, will help us to keep track of what we're doing. Whenever we see a function with carrots, we should realize that it's a singularity function and not a regular function. This term, this is always going to be x and minus. And then we're going to have the location, A, is the location of the start of the load, or the location of wherever the load is that we're applying, okay? And then we're going to have an exponent. In the handbook, I call it N, but then in order to avoid uh, conflict with another term in a table I'm going to show you in a minute, I'm calling it E here, okay? Then we're going to go to this figure, table 721 from our handbook, and this tells us what the loading function is is for a number of different kinds of loads. You can see we have a moment, a point moment, a point force, a distributed load, a gradient load, and an exponential curve loading. Each of these, it tells us how we're going to do it. For the moment, we're going to have wx equals m x minus a to the minus 2 power is our loading function. Now you'll notice this a is wherever this starts. If the moment occurs at the left end of the beam, A will be 0. If it occurs at the right end of the beam, A will be L, and we won't write the term. If it's anywhere in between, we will put in the distance from the left end to that point, to where that load is applied. You'll notice, according to this little graphic, that we're calling this a positive moment. And so if we have a moment that's going in this direction, uh, clockwise, then we will call that a positive moment, okay? If it's going the other direction, we'll stick a negative right in front of that m. And we will always give our loading function the exponent minus 2. If we see a point force, we will place the magnitude of the force at the start of the, uh, the function. If it's upward, it's positive. If it's downward, we put a negative in there. The A is the wherever that La Force is, is occurs from the left end of the beam to wherever it occurs, and we use an exponent minus two. If we have a uniform gradient, uh, a uniform distributed load, we're going to put in the W, the that's the pounds per inch. We're going to put in A as the start of that distributed load, and the exponent will be zero. Now it's worth noting here that this function starts at A, but it goes to the end of the beam. This means that uh, because loading functions are kind of like men, once you turn them on, it's very difficult to turn them off. So this function, once we turn on this distributed load function, we're going to have to do something like a cold shower on this thing in order to turn it back off. And I will show you how to do that. And the way that will be is we're going to have to introduce another distributed load function that turns that off. Sometimes this will be rather straightforward. Sometimes it's a little tricky. Stay tuned. We'll show you how that's done. And we're going to use a, an exponent of zero. Gradient loads also st start. Now, instead of the magnitude of the gradient w, what we're going to do is put in the slope of that gradient. So if the topmost point of the gradient is w pounds per inch, going from 0 to w pounds per inch in a nice linear fashion, then our slope is just k, is just going to be w divided by b, where b is the, the, the distance along the beam, the x distance from the start of that gradient to the end of the gradient. You plug that k into your, uh, your function, and you stick in an exponent of 1 for the loading. If we have any kind of exponential curve, as we see in the last one here, we can use the order of the curve, n, and uh, like a second, a first order would be that gradient, that straight line that we just saw. A second order would be a squared term, or n is 2, a third order, n equals 3, and so on. In all cases, we're going to define k, which is not quite the slope, 
we're going to define k as w over b, where b is the x distance from start to finish of that uh, grade of that exponential curve. We're going to then use that k in our equation with an exponent of n. So for the gradient, we already saw that n was 1. For a second order, that n would be 2. For a third order, that n would be 3, and so on. You see that? Okay, you'll notice this also starts and continues on until the end of the beam, as does our gradient. So with those ideas in mind, and notice that that is also positive upwards. If we have a downward run, we'll stick a negative sign in there. All right, so that's how it works. Let's drill this down a bit further. But first, let's look at the mathematical definition and any special rules we need for dealing with these gradient functions. So the mathematical function of the, of the singularity function, it's called a Macaulay function, or it's a, a similar form, is basically defined like this. It's x minus a to the 0, and it's defined as 1. If that exponent is 0, it's defined as 1 whenever we're at x or beyond. And it's defined as 0 before we reach x. This has the, this has the uh, effect of ignoring this term until we pass the point where a is along the b moving from left to right. Now, if our exponent of this function is not 0, if it's anything else, then we use the second term here. And if it's uh, x minus a to the n, then uh, and if x is greater than a, then it's equal to x minus a to the n. And if it's less, if x is less, then it's 0. Okay. That's how it works. We're also going to ignore these terms before that exponent becomes 1. That exponent at 0 is defined, and when exponent is n is positive, it's defined. When that exponent is negative, we will ignore those terms. Okay? So that's the mathematical term. If we were to plot these, we would see this. A, uh, when we have the exponent 0, as we see in the leftmost figure, it's like having nothing, nothing, zero, our load is zero, zero, zero for that term. And then as soon as we hit that A, it suddenly springs into being. This is a discontinuity that normally doesn't work with continuous calculus. But with these singularity functions, we can uh, trick it into working for us. If our exponent is one, then we see we're going to have a gradient. It springs into being at A, and instead of jumping to some magnitude, it starts climbing towards some at some rate. And x minus a to the squared will be an exponential curve, and it grows also like a gradient, but it grows increasingly faster. So that is the definition of the function, and that's how we treat we will treat that function when we encounter it in our equations. We will also have a couple, a slight twist on the way we normally do integration and differentiation. Let's take a look at that. So if we integrate this function, we'll notice it basically follows standard integration rules with a twist, okay? Whenever we have, uh, for example, if we take the integral of x minus a to the n power dx, then normally we would have an n minus 1. That n goes to n plus 1, and we throw an n plus 1 to the denominator plus our constant of integration. This is still true. Whenever n is greater than or equal to 0, this is true. However, if n is equal to minus 1 or minus 2, then all we're going to do is ratchet that exponent. So the n goes to n plus 1. Uh, and we do not throw down that denominator as we normally do with normal calculus. That's the only difference. Makes it quite simple to implement. Okay? If we differentiate, that same principle applies. If we're taking the derivative of x minus a to the n, then as long as n is greater than or equal to 1, then it follows normal uh, differentiation. It throws that n out in front of the brackets, and it ratchets our exponent down by 1. However, if n is smaller than 1, then we will only ratchet the n downward by 1, and we will not throw n out in front. Okay? That's the only difference. This makes it quite easy to 
apply the simplest kind of calculus. This is the simple calculus that when we encountered this in our calculus classes, we started to like calculus. It wasn't until later when all these other things that were not as useful and were much harder with no practical usage inside that a lot of you started hating calculus. Calculus is our friend. It's a tool for conquering certain kinds of problems. And in this case, it's actually quite easy to implement. All right. so. If we, uh, once we understand that, we're ready to start trying to use these. We're going to use this table 721. And for any load, external load that we find, we are going to characterize our loading function from this for each and every loading term. We're going to write our loading function, which will include one of these terms for every load that we find from left to right of the beam, except for the rightmost end. We then, taking having carefully written our loading function for each and every term, we're going to integrate that, as we saw with the whole change function idea, which we will get another video on. We're going to integrate that, and that will give us the shear. And then, having we can take that shear, and we can integrate that again, and that will give us the moments. Now, both times when we take the integral of the shear and the integral of the moment, or excuse me, when you take the integral of the load to get the shear, we're also going to have a constant of integration that pops out C. But we're going to find out, and actually we're not going to focus on it here. We actually uh, look at that in some other videos. You'll find out that that constant of integration for that integration from W of X to V of X always disappears. It always vanishes when you apply input your boundary conditions of the loading at the constraints. And when we integrate our shear to the moment, we're going to find that that constant integration also will vanish once we apply our boundary constraints. For this reason, we can be a little careless and leave that C off. However, next lecture, when we start looking at integrating our moment to get the slope and then again to get the deflection, if you don't include that constant integration for those two integrals, you will often get wrong answers. Okay? All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at how this works, writing our singularity functions for the loads. So let's start with this beam. We saw before that this required two functions for V of X and two functions for M of X when we use con normal continuous functions. But now all we need to do is do the write the loading diagram. So we go to our table, our singularity function table, 721, and we write our function. We're going to start at the left end. We're going to say W of X equals, and the first external load we find is R of A, R at A. That actually is pointed upward, so it's positive. We look at our table. We see it's the second term in the table. And so this is it here. This is positive, same direction. So this is positive. This starts at zero, and the exponent is minus one. We then come to the next load on the beam. That's our force, P. That's acting down, so it's negative because it's the opposite direction of what's shown here. We're going to have X minus, and then where does that start? It starts at A inches from the end of the beam. And our exponent, once again, is minus 1 for uh, four forces. Now that's the entire loading. There's only one other term that could be written, and that's the RB. But since that's at the right end of the beam, that is not required. We will ignore it. We now can integrate to get our shear. So we take that and following rules of integration, since these exponents are both less than zero, they just ratchet up without throwing anything out. So V of X is just RA X minus zero to the zero minus P X minus A to the zero. We can get the moment by integrating again. And when we do that, once again, now our zero is going to ratchet up to the one. And we end up with this function for m of x. You see we have one loading function for the entire beam, one loading what shear function for the entire beam, and one moment function for the entire beam. Now, that may not seem impressive to you. But stick with me, and you will see how powerful this can become. Now, if we have uh, 
this moment load on the beam, we will follow the same approach. We will start by writing our loading function. Now we have a point force at RA, and we have a moment. That moment is in the same direction as what is shown in our table. Same direction, so it's positive. It starts at x equals a from the left end, and we have an exponent of minus 2. So that is our loading function. We then integrate to get the shear. We then integrate to get the moment. See how easy that is? Okay, now we have this guy. This looks more challenging. We needed three functions of v and three functions of moment before. We look at this. We say, okay, we're going to start by writing the leftmost term. We've got ra. That's a force. It's upward, so it's positive. It occurs at zero, so our a is zero. Exponent minus one. We then move from left to right along the beam, and as we do, our next load is the start of the w term. So we look over here, we find a similar load. Ours is down, this one is up, so we're going to have a negative w going here. Then we're going to have x minus, it starts at a, which is right here. And so we're going to put an a in there, and our exponent is zero. Now the problem is, when we create that function, what it does is it goes all the way to the end. So we actually need to remove this part of the load. So we will introduce one more function, one that is a distributed load that acts upward from this point to this point. So we're going to end up writing another term. This one was negative w, so we'll make this a positive w. x minus is always there. And then the starting point of that new function is going to be this distance, which is a plus b, exponent 0. Now we have all of the terms on this beam, and we can integrate for the shear, and we can integrate for the moment. How about this guy? Now we see, oh my gosh, this looks like a challenging equation, but it's not as hard as it looks. All we're going to do is work from left to right. We're going to write our loading function. You'll notice, working from left to right, we're going to say, okay, we got RA at zero. So we look at our thing. There's our RA. It's upward, so it's positive. It starts at zero and has an exponent of minus one since it's a force. We go along the beam and we say, okay, next we have P. It's acting downward, so it's negative. It starts at X equals A. And it has an exponent of minus 1 since it's a force. Now, one thing before we continue, you got to watch out. So sometimes we dimension like this. And other times, you know, these, this also, this is dimension A, this is dimension B. But actually, C, you'll notice that there is no arrowhead right here. There's no arrowhead here. This arrowhead goes from the left end to here. This is common in drafting. The next one, D, goes from here to here. When you see an arrowhead on the right but not on the left of that little span, that means it doesn't end until it gets all the way to the next left arrowhead. So B is from here to here. C is from here to here. D is from here to here. E is from here to here. F is from here to here. And G is from here to here, or the length of the beam. So you'll need to be careful and make sure you're understanding the way your beam is dimensioned when you're using these. So we already wrote this term and this term for that load and that load. Now we come here to x equals b, and we start our w. It actually is acting downward, so we will put a negative sign. It starts at x equals b, so we put a b here, and our exponent is 0 for those. Now that function would go all the way to the end of the beam. So we're going to turn it off when it gets to this side. We're going to flip the opposite of this, which is positive w, starting x equals c, where that ends, and giving the same exponent. We then go along. We find our next load is this point force, which is acting downward. It starts at x equals d, and our exponent is minus 1 for forces. We then get another distributed load with the same magnitude w starting at e. So, and that's downward, minus w starting at e, 
exponent zero. But that also stops before the end of the beam. So we're going to need to turn it off with the opposite of that function, positive w, starting at f and having an exponent of zero. And we don't need the term on the right end. That's how it works. We can now integrate that to get the shear. This is a really simple integration. Our minus one goes to a zero, minus one goes to a zero. Zero goes to a one, zero goes to a one, minus one goes to zero, zero goes to a one, zero goes to a one, bang. Then we can integrate and we find that also is quite simple. Our zero goes to a one, zero goes to a one, one goes to a two and throws a two down here. One goes to a two and throws a two down here. Zero goes to a one, zero goes to a, excuse me, one goes to a two and throws a two down here. One goes to a two and throws a two down here. Bang! And we don't need the constant of integration. Before we had seven terms seven different shear functions, seven different moment functions. This would be a nightmare to try and calculate slopes and deflections where we're headed. But with a singularity function, it makes it quite easy. Now we characterized a couple loads that didn't quite fit our table before. So let's focus on that a minute because this is an important step of being able to implement to use singularity functions accurately. When we have a function like this, you'll notice our R is fine, our RA, but our loading stop before the end of the beam. When we look at our table, we find we don't have a loading like this. We have only a loading that starts somewhere and goes to the end of the beam. That means we're gonna have to take this load and turn When we turn it on, it goes all the way to the end, okay? That means we can write one term for that load, but it goes all the way in. We're going to need to write another term that will get rid of the piece here. So that first term goes all the way to the end of the beam once we turn it on. And then we write another term starting wherever that thing ended at this point. This one starts there, and that turns it off. That's equal to the negative of that W. Since the W is down, that now becomes a positive. And now both of them run to the end of the beam, and these two loadings are equivalent. Now, if we have a gradient like this, if we look at our table, we find, wait a minute, we have a gradient that increases, but not a gradient that decreases. That means we're going to have to characterize this load. And the way we do that is by looking and putting in things that already occur on the, on the, uh, in the table. So if we look at this, we can say, okay, we can do it this way. We can take this W and instead of putting a gradient down, we could put a gradient that goes like this. That's this guy here. And then we can take another gradient and subtract it. You'll notice this is this gradient is going in the same direction as our source gradient. Then we can take another one, put it like this in the opposite direction. If this has magnitude w and this has magnitude w, then at this end it completely removes uh, this, and at this end it doesn't remove it at all, resulting in the function we wanted. So characterizing the grade, this reverse gradient load would involve putting a distributed load across the entire beam and then removing the piece that we don't want with another gradient. Make sense? If we have a partial gradient, it gets a little more challenging because what's going to happen is when we apply this gradient to our beam, it is going to go on like this, upward. We then are going to need to remove this portion as a distributed load and this portion as a gradient load. So let's take a look at how that works. We look at our table, we see, okay, we've got a gradient like this, but it goes to the end of the beam. So when we put this on, our first loading is going to be turning this gradient on. Now you'll notice 
this W here, it's W at the highest point, but that highest point occurs here, not here. So when this, if this is A, and if this beam is two A's long, then by the time it gets to the other end, it will be 2W tall. Therefore, when we characterize this loading, we're going to characterize it with a loading that's 2W, which starts at the left end and goes to the right end. That will give us exactly what we want here, and it will give us two pieces we don't want here and here. So now we will characterize the next piece. We will add two loads in the opposite direction, this one equal to W going down, and this one equal to W going down. And when we sum these two together, we will get exactly this loading. That is how you characterize your equations, your loading. So just to kind of wrap this up, our implementation process for any beam we might find is like this. We will first calculate all reactions for the beam. Now it's true that every now and then when singularity functions, we'll find a beam that doesn't require calculation of, this, of the reactions in order to start working. But actually it's good practice to do it unless you're doing enough of these to be certain when that's valid and not. We then characterize our loading. All that means is identifying which term in that table of singularity functions we're going to use. And for any loading that doesn't occur in the table, uh, come up with a simulated set of loads until you have a combination, all of which added together, perfectly match one of those cases, or the case that we have. Okay? We then write our loading function W of X for each and every external load, except for the any forces occurring at the right end in moments. We then integrate our loading function for V, and we integrate our V for M, and we can ignore our constants of integration for these two integrations. That is how you can write singular, use singularity functions to get the shear and moment diagrams of beams. Next lecture, we will learn how to calculate slope and deflection using these uh, singularity functions, and you'll find out that it's a very powerful method, and singularity functions really make it more simple for us to implement. Okay, so study your homework, review this material. If you are in industry and trying to master this, then try some of the examples. Some of my other and older videos have a number of examples that I saw through. You can pull up some of those and look at those and try and do those yourself. Okay. Enjoy.